because if they don't demand the say, they're going to pay, pay, and pay. And that's what's happened throughout history, because greed is infinite. And if you don't have boundaries, if you don't have standards, if you don't have stop signs, if you don't have caution signs, if you don't have law and order, it's going to go off the deep end uh, because the few will take the many uh, and exploit them and uh, try to jump into a golden rowboat just before the ship sinks, otherwise known as golden parachutes. In 1775, the American Revolutionary War began as the American colonies sought to detach from England and its oppressive monarchy. But though many reasons are cited for the revolution, one in particular sticks out as the prime cause, that King George III of England outlawed the interest-free, independent currency the colonies were producing and using for themselves, in turn forcing them to borrow money from the Central Bank of England at interest, immediately putting the colonies into debt. This is a dictator we have here. This is a monarch. This is King George IV. This is the most impeachable president in modern history. This is the president that criminally got us into the Iraq war. Uh, this is the president that didn't know what to do after Katrina. Uh, this is a, uh, a bunch of gangsters who've hijacked our federal government uh, out of the White House. And why do we expect them, with their corporate buddies in Wall Street, uh, to do anything that would help the average worker, the average small investor, and the average taxpayer. And as Benjamin Franklin later wrote, the refusal of King George III to allow the colonies to operate an honest money system which freed the ordinary man from the clutches of the money manipulators was probably the prime cause of the revolution. In 1783, America won its independence from England. However, its battle against the central bank concept and the corrupt, greed-filled men associated with it had just begun. I've always, since I was young, very concerned about the corporate uh, excessive influence over our government, going back decades, the robber barons, the late 19th century. And I don't think we've ever seen anything as bad as this. This is a real takeover of the U.S. Treasury, of the White House, uh, the Pentagon, almost every department agency. It's a power grab of historic proportions. And I think it involves the White House trying to rip up the Constitution from Congress, take away its authority, put it in the White House so they can do whatever they want with $700 billion of the taxpayers' money. So what is a central bank? A central bank is an institution that produces the currency of an entire nation. Based on historical precedent, two specific powers are inherent in central banking practice. The control of interest rates and the control of the money supply or inflation. The central bank does not simply supply a government's economy with money, it loans it to them at interest. Then, through the use of increasing and decreasing the supply of money, the central bank regulates the value of the currency being issued. It doesn't take a lot of ingenuity to figure this scam out. For every single dollar produced by the central bank is loaned at interest. That means every single dollar produced is actually the dollar plus a certain percent of debt based on that dollar. And since the central bank has the monopoly over the production of the currency for the entire country, and they loan each dollar out with immediate debt attached to it, where does the money to pay for the debt come from? It can only come from the central bank again which means the central bank has to perpetually increase its money supply to temporarily cover the outstanding debt created which in turn since that new money is loaned out at interest as well creates even more debt the founding fathers of this country were well aware of this Some of it comes from Franklin Delano Roosevelt, which they dismantled in the Clinton administration. There used to be a, a law called Glass-Steagall Act. It worked very well. It basically says you're either a commercial banker uh, or you're just a regular conventional banker. You don't get people's money and, and, not, and, not, and be able to 
uh, use it with your securities uh, work. Uh, there's a conflict of interest there. The two don't mix. Well, Clinton got rid of Glass-Steagall under the influence of Robin Rubin, who then went to Citigroup and made $40 million after he left the Treasury in four months of consulting, right after the bill passed. What a coincidence. <laughs> and uh, as, as a result, uh, they could do anything. They could take your money uh, as, as, in the insurance premiums. They could take them in deposit. They could take it in, in your mortgage payments. They could take it in other kinds of loans and so on. Mix it all up and get it and invest in very risky, uh, what they call collateralized debt obligations. Uh, very few people understand. And kaboom, the thing can go. Speaking of kaboom, what's happening today is capitalism is being bailed out by socialism. And that's why it always can be reckless, because it knows that it can always call on Uncle Sam to save it. And uh, uh, the free market ideology of these corporate capitalists is crumbling, but without any shame, they're now saying, hey, folks, you're all going to get hurt. All you little people are going to get hurt. So we've got to be bailed out by your tax dollars in Washington. This is really offensive to people. This has really got down to their sense of gross greed and lack of fairness. And that's why they're beginning, uh, the rumbles beginning around the country. In 1910, a secret meeting was held at a J.P. Morgan estate on Jekyll Island off the coast of Georgia. It was there that the central banking bill called the Federal Reserve Act was written. This legislation was written by bankers, not lawmakers. This meeting was so secretive, so concealed from government and public knowledge, that the ten or so figures who attended were told they could only use their first names in addressing each other. After this bill was constructed, it was then handed over to their political frontman, Senator Nelson Aldrich, to push through Congress. And in 1913, with heavy political sponsorship by the bankers, Woodrow Wilson became president, having already agreed to sign the Federal Reserve Act in exchange for campaign support. And two days before Christmas, when most of Congress was at home with their families, the Federal Reserve Act was voted in, and Wilson in turn made it law. Uh, but it, it's massively bigger in all kinds of ways. Uh, the SNL bailout uh, involved a lot of hearings. There was deliberation. This is like a, you know, ram it through, quick, before you adjourn and go back home for the elections. And it's very dictatorial. Very, very dictatorial. Years later, Woodrow Wilson wrote, in regret, Congressman Lewis McFadden also expressed the truth after the passage of the bill. A world banking system was being set up here, a super state controlled by international bankers acting together to enslave the world for their own pleasure. The Fed has usurped the government. For example, from 1914 to 1919, the Fed increased the money supply by nearly 100%, resulting in extensive loans to small banks and the public. Then, in 1920, the Fed called in mass percentages of the outstanding money supply, thus resulting in the supporting banks having to call in huge numbers of loans, and, just like 1907, bank runs, bankruptcy, and collapse occurred. Over 5,400 competitive banks outside of the Federal Reserve System collapsed, further consolidating the monopoly of a small group. I warned the FDIC that they weren't assessing the banks for enough money in case banks failed and they had to guarantee uh, deposits up to $100,000 in 1996, in 2005, in just this last July. And they weren't assessing the banks in the good times. Now they're going to run out of money. And they're going to have to call on the taxpayer rather than the banks to supplement their insurance budget. Uh, we, 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 we've predicted this all along. But, you know, in Washington, D.C., if you're right, you're ignored. If you're wrong, you might get a syndicated radio show. Um, so any bailout plan should protect the prudent and the safe investors who are at risk because of the crooks and the speculators. You don't start at the other end and try to bail out the speculators. And if you're going to bail out anybody, you have to have comprehensive regulation so it never happens again. You have to have taxpayer participation so the taxpayer can get paid back in case these companies recover. You've got to have full disclosure, and you've got to have more power to the shareholders 
to control the company and the bosses of the company they own. If shareholders like mutual funds and pension funds had that kind of authority, which they don't have now, these bosses would never have gotten away with destabilizing and tanking their own company to elevate their own bonuses and huge compensation packages. You want a second opinion? A first opinion. An opinion that you'll like. Go to votenator.org.